Now, in Canada, we have a different system for immigrants because as an immigration officer, they have to get leave from the court before they can challenge a decision made by an uh, immigration officer or a CBSA officer. In non-immigration matters, there is no leave requirement. But with immigration matters, they created this uh, threshold that you have to cross. For instance, when I was first practicing, everybody had a right to a hearing about whether they should be allowed to stay here or not. As long as they were a permanent resident or they were a refugee, they could make the case. Now that's impossible. A person in that situation wouldn't even have a chance at a hearing. What happened as matters evolved is that um, there are thresholds set were created to restrict access to the potential to have that story told in that place and that before that tribunal. That was the beginning of what became a graduated reduction of the discretion. So that they imposed a review, a paper review, so that one that wouldn't involve a hearing to determine whether or not a person would have access to this board to be able to tell their story. And if they were found to be a danger to the public, which was the consequence of, and, and the subject matter of the review, then they didn't have a chance to go to the hearing. At our office, at the Refugee Law Office, we help many, many people who are facing that combination of mental illness, deportation, and detention situation. First of all, you need to have a lawyer. Secondly, it's kind of discretionary, so you don't have a right to go to the federal court. All you have is the right to ask the federal court for permission to do an appeal, for permission to do a judicial review. And the federal court denies, I think over 80% is the number, over 80% of requests for leave for judicial review, for permission for judicial review. So most cases don't even make it before the court. And once they do get to a court, the federal court generally applies a very sort of deferential, hands-off approach to decisions made by CBSA officers. So they will only step in if the decision is so bad that it's just unreasonable. That's a difficult threshold to reach for many. Here's another thing, that's how immigrants are treated differently in the legal process or immigration matters are treated differently. You go to the judicial review and if you lose your judicial review, you cannot appeal the decision of the judge who refused your judicial review unless the judge gives you a, uh, what you call a certified question, which means the person who denies you your remedy has to decide whether he wants you to appeal his decision. In other federal court matters, there is no certified question requirement. You don't need the judge to say, I have to okay you to appeal my decision. If you want an appeal, you just go to the next level. One was called the Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act. They removed the right to appeal for um, people who were deemed seriously criminal as well they authorized a way to share information for people who might be determined as seriously criminal. So we attached people who had mental health issues and who are immigrants to dangerousness, to serious criminality, so they could be surveilled, so we could collect data on them and observe them, so that we could also lock them up indefinitely, deport them, and deny their right to appeal in one piece of legislation after the other. Notions that immigrants are not worthy, that they're untreatable and they carry with them criminality, which is a lie. It's based on a very problematic, that very much relies on that Eurocentric view of history. If a crime could be serious based on the maximum sentence, even though the actual sentence you get is relatively minor, we will use the, the maximum sentence as a guide to decide whether this is a serious offense or not. Even though the offense that you committed only gives you a month in jail, the potential of it being a serious offense will make it a serious offense for you. They look at the worst case scenario and treat that as if you committed the worst case scenario. And that's ironic because if you didn't commit the worst case scenario, then why are they using the worst case scenario on you? They also include six months sentence. So if you get sentenced to six months, even though the maximum punishment may not be very high, but you get sent to jail for six months, then you also become removable without a chance for humanitarian compassion grounds review.
Many crimes could result you in getting six months in jail. Even uh, drinking and driving, if you are the uh, second time around, it doesn't have to cause injury to people. The easiest way to get them out is based on maximum sentences. Now it's uh, five years. If it's five years or more, you can be deported without review. Because it used to be 10 years, but now it's changed to five. Plus the six months. So it's a double whammy. Double whammy in the sense that if you get sentenced six months, you're out no matter what the maximum sentence is. And the immigration uh, legislation is full of these kind of examples that if there's a choice of going easy or hard, they go hard. They never go easy. There needs to be for sure much more education and support for folks who are being charged and appearing before a judge to enter a plea. They need to make sure that they are getting access to mental health treatment if there's a mental health issue and that there is information available to counsel before they plead. A number of things that need to happen to bring the regime into accordance with Canada's obligations under international law and under our constitution. That means that we need laws that very clearly articulate the rights of people who are mentally ill and that very clearly establish a process for oversight over decision makers and so that we can hold decision makers to account. Right now, the system is entirely inadequate for holding decision makers to account.